Wonderful. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you would help me speak this morning. Father, let it be your words that make a difference in people's lives. Not my philosophy, not what I think, oh God, but what the Word of God says. Let it stir faith. Let the Word of God stir faith. And let there be signs and wonders that follow the preaching of the Word. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, this morning I'm preaching part three of my four-part series on the Songs of Ascent. The 15 Psalms from Psalm 120 to 134 that talk about ascending to the house of God. I'll do a quick little overview for those of you who are coming in late or it's been so long since I did number two. So there are 15 Psalms that start with the same description and they are this, a song for pilgrims ascending to Jerusalem. So if God takes the time to start 15 psalms with the same words, I think it's good for us to take notice. So we saw that the people of Israel were asked by God to go up to Jerusalem, which was a city on a hill, go up to Jerusalem three times a year for special festivals and celebrations. And so three times a year, they would go up there and they would sing these 15 psalms. Remember, psalms were meant to be sung. They're not so much meant to be read. So they were songs that they would, they would sing. And if you think about it, it was actually genius of God that would see these people have their hearts ready to encounter him. Fifteen different reminders that would prepare their spirit before they began to even worship God. Fifteen things that would remind them of who God was, of how valuable he is in our lives, of what he can do and what he finds valuable. Fifteen exhortations of God's love, of God's mercy, of God's commitment and God's understanding of them. So as a quick, very overview, reminder number one was from Psalm 120 and it's, we are not of this world, saying that as Christians we live a different way and have a different mindset to the people of this world, so there's going to be antagonism towards us and our message because we come from a different worldview. Psalm 121 was reminder number two. Remember who you're looking at. Using scriptures like, I look up to the mountains. My help comes from God who made heaven and earth. God who never sleeps. A God who never slumbers. And then uses these great words, the Lord himself watches over you. Who are you looking at this morning? Number three reminder is be glad, be happy, be joyful. It says, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go up to the house of the Lord. And and, and, and that the house of God is a place for us to bring and give thanks to God and to have a thankful attitude. How did you come to church this morning? Did you come with a thankful attitude? And then it also says, I come to the house of God for the sake of my family and for the sake of my friends. That that church was never just about us, but for those people that we come into contact with. Reminder number four is who do you take your cues from? And we see the scripture that says, we keep looking to the Lord for his mercy, just as a servant keeps their eye on the master. And are you looking and ready to hear God speak into your life? Psalm 124, reminder number five is testify. What if the Lord had not been on our side? What what are you telling people about? Are you telling people about the stories of God in your life, the stories of God's intervention, the stories of God's provision, the stories of God's deliverance? Is that the stories that you're telling people? Psalm 125, reminder number six, make up your mind to trust him. In a society that that is so overcome with anxiety, the Bible says make a decision to trust God, to, to not actually just kind of go, I think I will, but to make a concrete decision that I'm going to put my mind on trusting him. Reminder number seven from Psalm 126 is that a harvest is coming. Those who plant in tears will harvest with shouts of joy. 
They will weep as they plant their seed, but they will sing as they return with harvest. That God doesn't see just the tough time you're going through. He sees what he's going to make out of you from that tough time. So let's get on. So I I was really nervous about that. I thought half my sermon is just going to be telling you the sermon that I did two weeks ago. right? So I've done it pretty good in five minutes. Not bad. All right, so let's get on with the next Saw Psalms of Ascent. Are you ready? Is anyone ready? Yes, good. Reminder number eight. Without God, we can achieve nothing. Psalm 127, a song for pilgrims ascending to Jerusalem, a psalm of Solomon. Remember, it was Solomon who built the temple. Unless the Lord builds a house, the work of the builders is wasted. Unless the Lord protects a city, guarding it with sentries will do no good. It is useless for you to work so hard from early morning until late at night, anxiously working for food to eat. For God gives rest to his loved ones. Children are a gift from the Lord. Some people said amen. And they are a reward. I was one of them. All right. And they are a reward from him. Children born to a young man are like arrows in a warrior's hands. How joyful is the man whose quiver is full of them. He will not be put ashamed when he confronts his accusers at the city gates. You know, this is a famous psalm. And it's one that many of us would have memorized at different times that, that would have helped us. Unless the Lord builds the house, those who labor, labor in vain. Right? It's God who's building his house. It's, it's something that touches our heart because it's actually simple and profound. Unless God's in it, it isn't going to work. Unless God's in it, it's only going to bring you frustration and an anxious spirit. I think about how comforting this verse has been to me over the years. Many times I, when I think of some relationship issue, some job issue, some career thing, some aspect of my ministry, it seems like it's failing, it seems like it's falling apart. And then I think, no, God is building this. God is building my life. I, I don't need to fear. I don't need to worry. God is building my life. It's he who is protecting me. It may seem terrible, but God will protect me. What does the Bible say? No weapon formed against you will prosper. Weapons will be formed, but they will not prosper. They will not prosper because God is building your life. There's a great insult in the Bible. There's some great insults in the Bible, but I, but I like this one. Nehemiah has been asked to build and rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. He starts building and they've got to fight and they've got to build and they've got to fight and they've got to build. And there was one of the opponents of Nehemiah, who wasn't at all happy that his wall was being built. His name was Sanballat. And he just yells out, Hey, Nehemiah, if a fox, a little fox, if a fox jumped up on that wall, it would fall over. It would fall over. And sometimes in the kingdom, sometimes in our lives, there comes times where we think, this thing is just not going so well. This thing isn't going the way that I would like it. If just a little negative thing happened, it would all just fall over. I know that as a pastor, I'll get the attendance results of a Sunday. I go, oh no, I need to pray more. I need to do this. I need to do that. And I try and bring it onto myself instead of saying, I give it to the Lord. It's the Lord who's building his house. It's the Lord who's protecting his house. And if as a pastor, if I just looked at attendance figures, one week I'm, ah, oh! and the next week is, oh, you, you understand, right? Like, because you're not always coming to church every week. Come on, make my week easier. See, sometimes a financial commitment comes due. Something happens and you, and you start to fear and you start to get anxious. Understand, it's the Lord who's building your life. It's the Lord who's protecting you. It may seem like it's going to overwhelm you, but you're going to get through. Don't allow fear and doubt and anxiety start to hit. Remember at that point, 
God's building the house and the house is your life. See, the thing is, I've got to remember, I'm doing this thing for God. I'm building my life because I'm trying to follow God. I'm not doing it for myself. I'm not doing it for my own notoriety. I'm doing it for God. See, I love what it goes on. It says it's useless for you to work so hard from early morning until late at night, anxiously working for food to eat, for God gives rest to his loved ones. See, if it's me who's doing all the work, then I have to work day and night. There's never going to be any rest. I'm going to neglect, neglect my family, my friends and myself, and I'm always anxious so I can't sleep. See, if I'm not actually trusting God, I'm in a place of trouble. See, you can do a lot of work in vain if you're building your own house. But none of your building will be in vain if you're building God's house. And then it goes on and speaks about children being a reward. Now, in the times when this was written, children was a sign of prosperity. Right, Kent would be the richest man in this church. Kent and Jeanette, right? Like they're, they're, it's a sign of prosperity. But what it's saying is, is that there's always going to be a fruitfulness when you allow God to build your house. And if you're young, when you get that fruitfulness, it's going to be something that keeps you in good stead for the rest of your life. There comes rest in letting God build. And letting God protect. If you're anxious, come into God's rest. Come into the rest that he promises you. Let it be and say, God, you're building this. You're building my life. You're building my work. You're building my family. You're building my inner self. I trust you with these things. Everyone say number nine. Reminder number nine. Prosperity is not a dirty word. Psalm 128, a song for pilgrims ascending to Jerusalem. How joyful are those who fear the Lord, all who follow his ways. Who's joyful today? How joyful are those who fear the Lord. You will enjoy the fruit of your labor. How joyful and prosperous you will be. Your wife will be like a fruitful grapevine. There you go, honey. Right, Flourishing within your home. Your children will be like vigorous young olive trees as they sit around your table. That is the Lord's blessing for those who fear him. May the Lord continually bless you from Zion. May you see Jerusalem prosper as long as you live. May you live to enjoy your grandchildren. May Israel have peace. You know, there's a term coined and it's called the prosperity gospel and generally it's used derisively generally it's it's used as a negative where someone wants to denigrate a particular pastor or or a particular evangelist because they see that they're trying to use the gospel to make money or they see and 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 sit something to themselves where they they sit and say well if you haven't got a house, a big house or a nice car that that somehow that means that God doesn't want to bless you or or you've got sin in your life or or you haven't got faith. Now, I want to tell you that is wrong teaching. That is wrong teaching because prosperity is not about stuff as we're about to see. Prosperity is far more than stuff. Prosperity is God blessing your life, but how does he do that? It doesn't mean you've got to have the latest Mercedes and four houses and, and all of those things. Because I would think that all of us agree that God didn't send Jesus to come to this world for our personal comfort, right? Just to, so you can have a better something. That's not the reason that Jesus came. But on a side note, right? Because there are people who do preach the gospel out of selfish motives, out of selfish gain. There are people, and you know what? That is not a new phenomenon. It is something that happened in Paul's day. And let's have a look, and this is a complete side note, got nothing to really do with my message, but I just, I just think it's interesting that people like this have always been around. 
And this is what Paul says. Those others do not have pure motives as they preach Christ. They preach with selfish ambition, not sincerely intending to make my chains more painful to me. But that doesn't matter. I love that. Whether their motives are false or genuine, the message about Christ is being preached either way. See, the power of the gospel is in what God does, it, not in the messenger itself. If I think it's about me, I'm always going to be in trouble. The message about Christ is being preached either way. So I rejoice and I will continue to rejoice. Yes, there are people who preach the gospel out of their own selfish motives, their own strength, and in greed. But I like to Paul's attitude. I'm going to rejoice and let God decide their outcome. Not me. I'm going to let God. This is why you'll never, ever hear me speak bad about another Christian pastor or a Christian evangelist. I may not do what they do. I may have a personal opinion about how they're running, whatever they're doing, but you will not hear me speak bad about them because it's for God to deal with them, not for me to deal with them. I'm going to leave them in God's hands and get on with what God has asked me to do. But though some bad things have been taught and bad actions have been done in the area of prosperity preaching, It doesn't mean that prosperity is wrong or not from God and not something that we should aspire to, right? It's something that we should want and believe for in our lives. But we've got to look at the original meaning of the word. The original meaning of the word prosperity used here, and by the way, it's used 236 times in the Old Testament So it's something that God cares about. It's not something he's silent about. 236 times he uses this word, but it means this. It means welfare, safety, contentment. It means to have peace and friendship in human relationships. It's not about stuff. It's about our heart. It's about who we are on the inside, that there's contentment. And who knows, it's relationships that really steal away most of our contentment. If I've had an argument with Nina, you know, maybe once every 20 years, right? When I leave home on that morning, even though I can be happy on the outside, ha, 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 do the little things I do, on the inside, that altercation, that discussion that we had, right? Where I was wrong, obviously, right? And... uh, that, 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 that sits with me until I get it right with her again. See, God wants you to have good relationships. That's why he says, live daily in forgiveness, yeah. forgiving others who have hurt you. Have your relationships that are strong. That will bring contentment. Be easy to forgive. See, if it's about stuff, if it's about having a better something, or being a better something, or being more famous, then, then, then it's so shallow. Yeah. You think about Hollywood. Hollywood actors have the greatest amount of money, the greatest amount of kind of people doing things for them. They're famous. We all want to know this person and have a selfie with that person. And, and, and they're famous, but look at their lives. Their lives are in misery, the majority of them, because their relationships are just terrible. They live such a surface lifestyle and such a surface kind of life that their insides are all over the place. And they're with this person and they're with that person. And it all becomes about the outside rather than true prosperity is about your inside. And so you can be the in a sense, have the least amount of stuff and actually still be prosperous and actually still be prosperous in your spirit because it's not about what you own. It's about an acknowledging who you are and that the fact that God loves you. See, the the psalm speaks of prosperity in our marriage and in our kids and in our work. And then it has this. He goes, that's the Lord's blessing for those who fear him. You can pray that promise today. You can ask God, God, I want my blessing. 
I want prosperity. See, you think about it, it's not actually rocket science. Fear God, consider God, respect God, and prosperity will be yours. It makes sense. If you follow the God who created you, who knows everything there is to know, who intimately knows you and then gives you the capacity to live the purpose life that he has for you, it only makes sense that you will then make good and wise decisions. You will treat others the way that you would like to be treated. You wouldn't allow greed and selfishness to be your motivation. And you will be forgiving in everything of your ways. It only makes sense that prosperity will come your way. So the next time you hear the word prosperity, don't get your knickers all in a knot, but believe God for it. Yeah, you will go through a tough time, a dark season, but the Bible says that there are treasures even to be found in darkness. And our next psalm that we read, our next reminder reminds us of that. Believe God for good things. Proverbs tells us the way of the upright is upward. Believe God for good things. Don't believe for bad. Believe for good friends. Believe for good kids. Believe for a good job. Believe for good marriages. Believe for good things to happen in your life. See, a Christianity devoid of joy is not a Christianity that God ever intended for us to live. It's the joy of the Lord that is our strength. Everyone say number 10. Reminder number 10. Some things you just got to live with. Psalm 129, a song for pilgrims ascending to Jerusalem. From my earliest youth, my enemies have persecuted me. Persecuted me. Let all Israel repeat this. So I have to repeat it. From my earliest youth, my enemies have persecuted me, but they've never defeated me. My back is covered with cuts, as if a farmer had ploughed long furrows. But the Lord is good, for he's cut me free from the ropes of the ungodly. May all who hate Jerusalem be turned back in shameful defeat. May they be as useless as grafts on a rooftop. I like that. Turning yellow when only half grown, ignored by the harvester, despised by the binder. And may those who pass by refuse to give them this blessing. The Lord bless you. We bless you in the Lord's name. Now, this is where Scripture can sometimes seem like it's double-minded. We've just read a scripture that says, believe for good, believe for prosperity, joy, joy, joy. And the very next psalm is talking about defeat, it's talking about kind of like your enemies coming and persecuting you from the time of your youth. So it's not even something that's gone away, right? And, and, And this psalm reminds them that they need to endure that they need to to keep on going rather than giving up. See, they are two sides of the coin. There's prosperity, but then there's perseverance as well. See, the phrase, from the earliest youth, my enemies have persecuted me, is repeated twice. There are some things in life that you just got to go through. There are some things that just, Don't change. You need to deal with them just as this psalm says, trust the goodness of God in the midst of it. You have to trust. You know, over the years, when we have a a young married couple who are going to get married, Nina and I will sit them down and we'll sit there and say, so do you think you ever question your love for your partner? And they almost like offended that we would ask them such a question. Of course not. Look at this girl. Look at this guy. He's an Adonis. She's a Venus. Oh, it's so beautiful. That's just like, I'm just going, all my life is going to run slow motion into their arms and I'm just going to love and feel love for them every single day. How dare you say, I love them unconditionally. Oh, there's nothing. Now, if you've been married longer than just a couple of weeks, Right, You know that's not always the feeling. Right, It's not always the feeling. There's going to be a one in a 50 year incident. 
something that happened. Something that happens that's just so shocking that, that you couldn't, my partner didn't, watch, she, he, like, it's going to be there. Something will happen that, that you'll go through. There'll be 50, something that happens 50 times in your 50-year marriage. There's some things that happen every day. And there's some things that just won't change. If I came to you today and I told the church, you know what, Nina is a terrible woman. You know why? She has got brown eyes. Her eyes are brown. Right? I'm sick of her brown eyes. Well, I can't believe she's got brown eyes. You would all agree with me. Brown eyes are full. I just hate brown eyes. You would all look at me and go, Mark, you are crazy. Right? And you need to get your life together. And I would need to. But there are some things of Nina's psychological makeup that are just as much part of her as the color of her eyes. And they'll never change. I remember in our early marriage, we would argue over this same thing. I would always argue. And the worst thing is, I felt that the scripture was on my side. <laughs> All right? So, and once you get a Dutchman thinking the scripture's on his side, right, you're in trouble. Right? So I am sitting there and I'm going, it's the Bible. It's the Bible. I married a non-Christian. I can't believe it. God, what's going on? This is the Bible. How? I just, I just can't. I just don't. And one day I was so mad with her. And I was just going, God. And I, I was driving to a hardware store, which is a very unique experience in itself. <laughs> right? Probably getting something for her. Right? But, uh, uh, but I, was, I, was, I was driving there. And like... I'm mad with her. I am so mad. And I'm mad with God for she won't listen to the Bible. And, and, I'm, and I'm just like, Ugh. and I go, God, you've got to tell her. Look at Luke 4. It says it right there, there, there. I am right. I am right. I am right. She needs to get and submit to her husband. Get behind. You know, like, just, you know, like, and I'm telling God this. And I'm meaning it. I'm with all the passion of my heart. I'm telling her. And this weirdest thing happens, right? I just feel God say to me, do you like olives? And I go, no, nah, olives are horrible. They're bitter and terrible and yucky. Right? And, and he says, does Nina like olives? And, uh, and I said, yeah, 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 Nina loves olives. She likes all types of olives. She always likes olives. And then I feel the Holy Spirit say, is Nina bad, evil, non-scriptural, and, and all of these things because she doesn't like olives? And I go, no, no, of course not. She's just, that's, the, that's her taste. That's just who she is. And then as clear as a bell, the Holy Spirit says, and so it is in this area. This is who she is. This is how I made her. And I want to tell you right then, all the malice, all the evil, all the anger that was in me, just like the drain plug was taken out, just, just dissipated immediately because I understood that there wasn't something evil or terrible going on. It's just how she is. And sometimes we've just got to renegotiate or look at our expectations. Disappointment is when I expect that this is going to happen and that happens. And so in this area, I had wrong expectations. I brought it down. Not, that doesn't sound right. I changed. I once I brought my expectations down. I changed my expectations and we very rarely, I won't say ever, but we very rarely now have strong discussions in that area. See, I have to change. I have to trust God's goodness. I have to be committed to the vows and the promises that I made. I have to live in forgiveness and softness of spirit. I have to show perseverance. I'm the one who's in control of what's going on. It's not Nina. It's me. And I have to be in control of those things. So it is in the Christian walk. Though God promises prosperity, there are just some things we have to endure. That is our cross to bear. That is our thorn in the flesh. It keeps us humble. 
It keeps us reliant on God and reminds us again and again and again how reliant we are on his grace. Learning to deal with the injustices of life, the obstacles that befall you, matures you and grows you. Just like a father allows his son or daughter to fall off their bike and scrape their knees knees a few times, eventually that child has the freedom and the joy of riding that bike by themselves. So it is our heavenly Father will allow us to go through some stuff so that we can experience the joys that he has for us. There is no victory, which we've heard a lot about today, without fight. The book of Judges tells us that God allowed different peoples to be left in the promised land. What does the Bible say? So that he could teach those who had never learned how to fight, how to fight. I want to tell you fathers in the, in the room here today, your job as a father is to teach your kids resilience, to be able to get through stuff. That stuff isn't always going to go well. That some things are tough. That some things are hard. That some things are unfair. That some things are unjust. You have to teach your children to do that. Instead of taking the side of everyone else and saying, you poor kid, sometimes teach your kid to get through it, to go through it. Our Heavenly Father does it to us. It's a maturing process. When my child was, was young and threw a temper tantrum, I, I, I took control of that because I didn't want them when they're older to have a temper tantrum and leave their job, leave their marriage, leave this, leave that. So I taught them young. And so it is in the things of God. Allow him to work in your lives. Our Heavenly Father teaches us resilience. Don't despise the tough things, the unjust things, the unfair things. Let God use them to mature you. Everyone say number 11. Grace, grace, glorious grace. Psalm 130. A song for pilgrims ascending to Jerusalem. From the depths of despair, O Lord, I call for your help. Hear my cry. O Lord, pay attention to my prayer. I love this line. Every Christian should should memorize this. Lord, if you kept a record of our sins, who, O Lord, could ever survive? But you offer forgiveness that we may learn to fear you. Not keep sinning. I am counting on the Lord. Yes, I am counting on him. I put my hope in his word. I long for the Lord more than a century is long for the dawn. Yes, more than a century is long for the dawn. O Israel, hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is unfading love. His redemption overflows. He himself will redeem Israel from every kind of sin. We sometimes think that God is different in the Old Testament to the God that's in the New Testament. But we see from this psalm that grace and God have always been one. That grace is an essential part of the character of of who God is. Verse 3, Lord, if you had kept a record of our sins, who, O Lord, could ever survive? See, every Christian should understand if without the grace of God, the unmerited favor of God, the choosing of God to forgive our sin, to see Jesus in light of our our sin... Right, You need to understand or you need to see that, but it's for a reason. This psalm actually shows us the true power of that grace. See, grace doesn't make you think, i good, I can keep on sinning because God doesn't keep a record of it. I'll, I'll just do this sin today because God doesn't even remember the sin that I just did. The Bible says he puts it as far as the east is from the west. He, he puts it behind his back. He, he puts it in a sea of forgetfulness. So, so I might as well keep on sinning. Yeah, hey, he doesn't even remember. Remember that sin I did last Thursday? God's up in heaven going, no, I've chosen to forget. So what happens is that doesn't mean, oh, good, I can sin today. Oh, I'm going to keep on sinning. God doesn't care. It's a very 
opposite of that. And if you think that, you actually don't understand grace at all. You don't get it at all. See, grace gives you power over sin. In recognizing God's incredible mercy and love, in forgiving you of your sin, your love for him increases, your understanding of him increases, and so you have strength to resist doing the very thing that was trying to separate you from him. Look at the response of the psalmist to the forgiveness of his sin. I am counting on God. I put my hope in his word. I long for the Lord more than a century, more than a God longs for the morning to come. That's the heart of grace. When you understand how forgiven you are, it makes you run to God to live the way that he would want you to live rather than live the way you just want to live. A real understanding of grace makes you love God, not sin. See, if you don't understand grace, you want to love sin. I want to continue doing that. I want to continue living like that. I want to continue having that because God forgives me anyway. And even though he does, it's not the way to live. When I get forgiven for my sin, it just makes me go, thank you, Lord. Why would I want to hurt you again? Why would I want to hurt you? I love David's response in Psalm 51. He says, only you, Lord, have I sinned against. Understand that it's your, your, your sin hurts the heart of God. Oh, God, I love you. Thank you. And so it gives you power over sin. It makes you want to get closer to him. I love him. So I live right now because I want to, not because I have to, not because of the threat of consequence, not because of the threat of punishment. I live right now because I want to live right now. I don't want to hurt God. I want a band to come. Forgiveness shows that God wants you. That God loves you. That God says, I want to get rid of all that that separates me and you so I can have fellowship with you. That's God's grace. He wants to show himself. He wants to reveal himself to you. You know, coming to church today with the attitudes that these Psalms reminds us is going to get us to a place where we can encounter God Free. If you understand that it's God who's building your life. If you understand that it's okay to believe for God to prosper you. That God can give you perseverance and help you endure through the tough times. Or the times that will never actually change that you've got to live with. And to remember that God's grace has set you up to encounter God. And this is what I want to stir. I want to stir in you a sense of personal wanting to encounter God. So I want you to close your eyes right now. And I'm going to pray. Father, I ask and I pray that the people of Emerged Church will want to encounter God. Will want to have an encounter with you, O Lord. Father, an encounter with you is something that stirs them, oh God. Father, there's not much me point me speaking about encountering you if there's not, first of all, a desire to encounter you, to know you, oh God. And Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that as people who go through these Psalms, that you're constantly reminding people, oh God. Father, I ask, oh Lord, Father, let it be that they understand your grace. Let it be, oh God, that they believe for prosperity. Let them see that you're building their lives and that you're going to get them through. Father, let there be an encounter with you, I ask in Jesus' name.